Hey there YouTube, what's up? Son of Terra 92 here, and today Science Epic tackles the quantum theory, or rather a very strange aspect of the quantum theory called quantum entanglement. But then again, to our primate minds that have evolved to think within the boundaries of classical mechanics and Newtonian physics, what part of the quantum theory wouldn't appear strange? To help me in this endeavor, I have called upon aid from a very notable video game character from the popular video game franchise, Mass Effect 2. Commander Shepard has agreed to take us on board her spacecraft, the Normandy, for a briefing on interstellar communications via quantum entanglement. So without further ado, I would like to invite you, the viewer, on board the Cerberus Space Operations Vessel Normandy, SR2. Take it away, Commander. this area of the ship. This is the FTL communications room. In addition to interfacing with the FTL comm network, Normandy is fitted with a quantum entanglement communicator linked to the elusive man's office. This allows lag-free communication even when you operate off the comm grid. I've never heard of a quantum entanglement communicator. How does it work? Essentially, two subatomic particles are created in an entangled state. One is installed here, and the other in the elusive man's office. When one particle occupies a given quantum state, its entangled partner will always enter the opposite state, no matter the distance between them. If we alter the state of our particle, that alters the state of the elusive man's. This allows us to send data in the form of quantum bits. Why aren't these used everywhere? Each quantum pair costs nearly as much as a comm relay, and can pass only one quantum bit of data at a time. In addition to the cost and bandwidth issues, the system is strictly point to point. To contact a hundred different worlds, we would need to manufacture and install a hundred entangled pairs, one linked to each world. That's all for now. Logging you out, Shepard. Thank you, Commander Shepard. You do humanity a fine service. Now, as mentioned in the briefing, interstellar communications is conducted between the deep space vessel Normandy and the office of the so-called Elusive Man. For those of you who have not played the Mass Effect 2 game, the Elusive Man is Commander Shepard's superior. Now, what this means is that the crew of the vessel can communicate with the elusive man regardless of their relative positions across space and time. So even if Commander Shepard is occupied in the farthest reaches of the galaxy fighting off the Reapers, she will always have a direct and instant link of communication between her and her superiors. It seems like a good idea, but there's one thing that really boggles the mind when it comes to interstellar communication or even communication in general with quantum entangled particles. Now here's the catch. We know that the fastest thing in the universe is the speed of light. And we know that this speed is finite. One does not simply disprove Einstein. Now radio waves occupy the longer wavelength section of the electromagnetic spectrum. And radio waves can be made to carry information. Now this is how our civilization communicates. This is how humans would talk to each other from one side of the globe to the other. And this is how we would expect other similarly advanced civilizations to communicate as well. Radio physics, radio astronomy, as well as the quantum theory 
is common throughout the entire universe. Now let's take a deeper look at quantum entanglement. Let's say I had two electrons, electron A and electron B. Now I could easily replace these two particles with particles of any other type, such as packets of light, photons, or small carbon molecules like buckyballs. But for the sake of simplicity, let's just use electrons. Now imagine for a second that these two particles are vibrating coherently, meaning that if something happens to one electron, the other one is automatically affected as well. Now when this happens, the two electrons are considered to be in an entangled state because of a mysterious Schrodinger wave in between them. Now imagine for a second that the total spin of this system, these two electrons, is zero, meaning that if one electron spins up, the other one must spin down. If I get on board a rocket ship with my electron, and you stay on Earth with your electron, and I travel to the other side of the galaxy and measure the spin of my electron to find it spinning upwards, I automatically know faster than the speed of light that the spin on your electron is downwards. Information has been made available to me instantly faster than the speed of light. However, it's somewhat random, thus kind of useless information. This is the basis of quantum entanglement, or spooky action at a distance. Now this raises a question. If Commander Shepard can communicate across the galaxy using quantum entangled particles, how would I go about in creating my own entangled particles for a quantum telephone network? Now the answer is simple. All you need is two things, a laser and a crystal. Now when you shoot a laser at a crystal, the lattice structure of the target will increase the chance, the probability, that the original beam of light, that photon beam, will be split into two, each with much lower energies, much lower frequencies, but with a far more stretched out wavelength compared to the original beam that was shot at the crystal. This is as per the law of conservation of energy. These two new photons are now entangled. By far, this method is one of the more straightforward and direct ways of creating entangled photons. Now that we have our quantum entangled photons or particles and whatnot, you might wonder what type of practical applications can we expect to come out of this very strange physical occurrence. Will measuring the spins of electrons help me to get faster computers for gaming or will it help me to get to work on time? Funny you should ask this because it just might. You see, whereas your classical computer expresses and understands information in terms of bits, ones and zeros, at one particular time, never both at the same time, a quantum computer will be able to understand information as a sum of many different quantum states. So someday, that computer sitting on your desktop might just describe information in terms of qubits, no longer the classical bit. And the high-tech processors of today, your Intel Core i7s and your Phenom, AMD Phenom X4s will be junk. Silicon technology will become inefficient. As for teleportation, such technology is still far ahead of yours or my lifespan or the lifespan of anyone alive on the planet right now for that matter. Sorry to burst your bubble. But many theorists would argue that if we are able to transfer meaningful information between entangled particles and their quantum states, what's to say we wouldn't be able to do it between macroscopic objects or subsequently objects much larger than that? It's definitely something really interesting to think about and even much more interesting to work towards, but I don't think it would be reasonable to look forward to go to school via teleporter anytime soon or to go to Mars via teleporter for a vacation. We're working on it, but I think we'll have to wait a few generations. We've all seen the eventualities of miraculous discoveries in the past lead to some form of exploitation. Let me tell you a story. When Michael Faraday first discovered the law of electromagnetic induction and presented it before a board of statesmen and politicians, the bigwigs and higher-ups 
were all too quizzical as to what the benefits and practical applications of that discovery would be. What would it be good for? Faraday, being the skeptical gentleman that he was, simply responded, whatever the applications may be, I'm pretty sure you're gonna find a way to tax people for it. And true enough, several centuries later, the law of electromagnetic induction is what runs our generators and our transformers. The very infrastructure that we need to get our civilization running. Could you imagine a day when you'd walk into a room and not expect it to have running electricity? What may be a complete mystery, what may be on the cutting edge of science and inquiry today might just be a toy in the palm of your hand tomorrow. That's all for me, Son of Terra 92, signing off. Join me next time on Science Epic as we hunt for aliens. I know that I had promised to make that in my previous video, but I kind of got sidetracked. Check out my blog, scienceepicyt.blogspot.com, and feel free to drop me a message on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. Remember to start thinking and start living. I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.